Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Kajal Chandal from University of Delhi. Today we are going to talk on module Transmission Electron Microscopy from the paper Characterization of Materials 1. So students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. In this module, the working principle of transmission electron microscopy will be described. Then, the instrumentation of transmission electron microscopy is discussed in detail. Subsequently, the electron interaction with matter has been discussed. Also, the image modes of transmission electron microscopy are studied. Emphasis is being laid on the transmission electron microscopy sample preparation. Transmission electron microscopy is also known as conventional transmission electron microscopy or it may be abbreviated as CTM. Max Noll and Ernst Schwuska invented it in 1933 in Berlin. Recent electron microscopy, which is based on transmission, commonly contains a beam collar, which is around 2.5 meter tall and has a 30 centimeter diameter. It has the ability to attain a 2 Armstrong resolution. This technique is utilized for analyzing the surface structure, that is morphology, surface imperfection, that is defects, crystal structure of the atom, size of the particle and also samples composition. Design of transmission electron microscope is similar to a light microscope. You can see in the figure that the TM uses an electron gun for illumination, which is similar to the lamp in wide field light microscope. Similarly, the electromagnetic lens is works as condenser lens in transmission electron microscope, whereas the glass lens serves the same purpose in wide field light microscope. The specimen in TM is the TM grid, which is a slide in wide field light microscope. The objective lens in TM is the electromagnetic lens, whereas it's the glass lens in wide field light microscope. Similarly, the projector lens is the electromagnetic lens in TM, and glass lens is the projector lens in wide field light microscope. The final image is made on a phosphorescent screen in TN, whereas it is detected by eye in wide field light microscope. So, the design of TEM is considered to be very similar to a light microscope. Let us now discuss the working principle of TEM. An extremely thin sample is required for scanning in TEM from which electron beam is passed through rendering its interaction with the sample as a result of which image is produced. This image can be magnified and focused on the device used for imaging, like a fluorescent screen on a photographic film layer or to be identified by a sensor like a CCD camera. We next discuss the instrumentation of TM. TM consists of a source of electrons, a gun based on thermoionic emission, a beam of electrons, the electromagnetic lenses, then the vacuum chamber, two condenser lenses, objective and intermediate lens, the sample holder and stage, Along with the phosphor or fluorescent screen, 
which serves as an imaging device and finally the computer which is interfaced to the system. The instrumentation of GM is also shown in the figure where the various components are arranged according to their usage. We next take up the electron gun. Electrons can be produced either by thermionic emission or by a process called cold field emission. During thermionic emission, a very fine tip of a tungsten filament, example, a Lf B6 crystal or zirconium oxide oblique tungsten Schottky emitter is heated by an electrical current flowing through it, thereby enabling the emission of electrons. The electrons leaving the filament have a low energy and therefore they need to be accelerated to the desired speed before entering the electron column. A high voltage between the electron source which is the cathode and an anode plate is applied leading to an electrostatic field through which the electrons are guided and accelerated. During cold field emission, the electrons can escape from an extremely fine tungsten tip without heating at room temperature. The advantage of cold field emission sources is the very high yield of electrons and the very low chromatic aberration of the electrons allowing imaging at atomic resolution. These instruments are very costly and require very high vacuum. The electron gun, the working of electron gun can be controlled based on three parameters. The first one is the accelerating voltage. The second one is the current of the filament and therefore its temperature and the third one is the Wendell's cap bias voltage. The temperature of the filament tip is controlled by the filament current which in turn controls the amount of emitted electrons. The filament current is increased till the number of emitted electrons no longer increases, which actually means that filament is saturated in order to maximize the emission. The passing current between the system having high voltage and ground is controlled by a bias resistance setting, which in turn is controlled by the gun bias. When small bias voltage is used, the Wendell's negative potential is ineffective in comparison to the filament. This leads to poor focusing of the electrons that are accelerated towards the anode. This results in beam spreading, causing it to appear weak on the screen. When the biasing is increased, the focusing action is improved. Therefore, the effective beam brightness is also increased. But beyond a certain value, the Wendell is so negative in comparison to the filament that the brightness starts to decrease because electrons are not permitted to emit from the filament or in the case they are emitted, they are repelled back in the direction of the filament. The point at which the finest brightness of the beam is attained is determined by the distance between the vanilt and the filament. We next study about the electromagnetic lenses. Electromagnetic lenses consists of a huge bundle of windings of insulated copper wire 
a soft iron cast and pole piece. The various components are shown in figure 3. A magnetic field is induced by the current in the winding and reaches its main strength at the pole piece of the legs. The accelerated electrons entering the magnetic field are deviated by Lorentz forces. The direction of both magnetic field as well as electrons defines the resultant force which is always perpendicular to the plane. In conclusion, the electrons take a circular path through the lens system which is shown in figure 3b. We can see that the electrons passing the magnetic field are deviated perpendicular to the plane defined by the magnetic field B and the velocity vector P. We next discuss the condenser lens system in details. The beam diameter is reduced and controlled by condenser lens system. The purpose of the first condenser C1 lens or spot size which is a strong lens is to demagnify the electron source image by around x1 divided by 100 to provide a small point source at the crossover that is more coherent than the large which is 50 micron diameter tip of the pyramid. The purpose of the second condenser C2 lens that is brightness or intensity which is a weaker lens is to project the demagnified image of the source on top of the sample by magnification of x2 giving an overall demagnification of x1 divided by 50. Illumination spread onto the screen which is controlled by the slits. A part named condenser aperture is positioned just below or sometimes between the condenser lenses. Its role is to collimate, that is, making parallel the beam of the electron as well as modification in its intensity. Next, the objective and intermediate lenses are discussed in detail. The reason behind the back focal plane being very close to the lens itself is because the magnification factor of the objective lens is larger. Aperture of the objective, it is the middle aperture on the column, is mounted in the back focal plane. The selected area aperture sits in the first image plane below the specimen, which is below both the objective lens and the objective aperture. By altering the first projector lens excitation, also known as intermediate lens or diffraction lens, either an image or a diffraction pattern is produced which is shown in figure 4. Let us next discuss about the specimen holders and stages. In TM, the electron column does not offer a lot of space for the sample. Further, the sample should be fine or thin so that electrons can penetrate the specimen to produce an image. The average thickness of a biological specimen should be around 70 nanometer for a TM with an acceleration voltage for the electrons of the order of 100 kilovolt. High voltages allow the investigation of thicker samples. Thin sections of the sample are mounted on copper grids 3 mm in diameter, which are available in a wide variety of materials and mesh sizes. The grids with the sections on top are attached in a holder and introduced into the goniometer of the TEM through a vacuum lock. Since the system always stays under high vacuum, the goniometer is the mechanical setup which enables highly precise 
and stable control of the specimen holder during immersion. Any drift or instability results in a blurred image, particularly at high magnifications. The thin sections of specimen on a TEM grid holder chip and the complete specimen holder which is introduced into the goniometer of TM through a vacuum lock is also shown schematically in figure 5. We next describe the vacuum systems. Vacuum system is employed in electron microscopes for four reasons. First, as electrons are readily scattered, electrons have a mean free path of approximately 1 cm at atmospheric pressure. However, at 10 is to power minus 6 pascal, they can have mean free path as high as 6.5 meter. The purpose of the vacuum system is to provide insulation between the filament of both anode and cathode as well as in the region around the field images, thus hampering undesirable discharge of the electron. In order to inhibit the oxidation and burning out of the filament, oxygen is eliminated around the filament. Then the sample contamination is decreased by reducing the interaction amongst electron beam and the molecules of gas. A typical vacuum system for a TEM is shown in the schematic in figure 6a. Here, the vacuum system consists of a rotary pump, a turbo molecular pump, an ion getter pump, and the oil diffusion pump. So, various microscope parts are differently vacuumed as per the requirements. The gun requires 10 is to a minus 9 pascal vacuum, while the specimen requires 10 is to a minus 6 pascal vacuum, which can be achieved through the turbo molecular pump or oil diffusion pump. The projection chamber plus camera requires a pressure of 10 is to a minus 5 pascal, which can be achieved through a rotary pump. Vacuums can be categorized as rough if the pressure range is between 100 to 0 0.1 pascal. It is called as low if the pressure range is between 10 is to minus 1 to 10 is to minus 4 pascal. Then the vacuum is categorized as high for pressures between 10 is to minus 4 to 10 is to minus 7 pascal and ultra high for pressures less than 10 is to minus 7 pascal. Let us discuss about the phosphor or fluorescent screen that is the imaging device. There are two procedures for specimen observation in transmission electron microscope which are shown in the figure. The first one is the image mode and second one is the diffraction mode. In case of image mode, the electron beam hitting the sample is controlled by condenser lens and aperture. The beam which is transmitted will be focused and enlarged by objective and projected lenses and the images formed on the screen with identifiable information in relation to the microstructure of the sample. In case of diffraction mode, at the fluorescent screen, a diffraction pattern of electron is obtained which originates from the electron beam illuminated sample region. The pattern of diffraction is completely similar to that of a pattern of X-ray diffraction. The spot pattern is produced by a single crystal on the screen, whereas polycrystal produces a pattern of powder or pen. The purpose of the image mode is to analyze the microstructure, example, the green size, the lattice effects, whereas the use of diffraction mode is to examine the crystalline structure. Let us now talk about the image modes of TM. In TM, the two primary image modes vary 
in the manner of using the objective aperture as filter in electron optic system. These modes are first is the bright field microscopy and second is the dark field microscopy. In bright field imaging, the image of the sample is created by the electrons that pass through the film without diffracting. A diaphragm is used to stop the diffracted electrons. In the corresponding dark field imaging mode, the image is formed by the diffracted beam which is shown in the figure 7. The technique is called as bright field which is mainly sensitive to extended crystal lattice defects in an otherwise ordered crystal. Example, dislocations. The electron rays corresponding to bright field and dark field imaging are shown in figure 7. Let us now discuss the electron interaction with matter. The interaction between the electron beam and the sample is coulombic. The negatively charged electrons can interact strongly with the electron cloud in the solid and also the positively charged nucleus. In contrast, X-rays are electromagnetic radiation and they only interact with the electron cloud. In transmission electron microscope, for imaging purposes, only the forward scattered electrons are of interest. There are two main types of scattered radiation. First one is the elastic. This represents coherent scattering, mainly with no loss of energy. There is also a phase relation with the incident radiation. The sec second one is the inelastic scatter. Here, the energy of the scattered electrons is lower than the incident beam. These are also incoherent radiation with no phase relation with the incident radiation. Let us now talk about the image modes of TM. In TM, the two primary image modes vary in the manner of using the objective aperture as filter in electron optic system. These modes are first is the bright field microscopy and second is the dark field microscopy. In bright field imaging, the image of the sample is created by the electrons that pass through the film without diffracting. A diaphragm is used to stop the diffracted electrons. In the corresponding dark field imaging mode, the image is formed by the diffracted beam which is shown in the figure 7. The technique is called as bright field which is mainly sensitive to extended crystal lattice defects in an otherwise ordered crystal. Example, dislocations. The electron rays corresponding to bright field and dark field imaging are shown in figure 7. It is now important to discuss about the TM sample preparation. Significant part of TM is its sample preparation for the analysis. There are two main conditions for TM sample preparation. First is the electron transparent sample must be used. If not the whole sample, at least the ROI should be thin. The allowed thickness value for the metallic samples is 30 to 50 nanometer. Usually, 100 nanometer is an upper limit for the sample thickness. The sample must be mechanically strong for treatment. TEM samples are either self-supported or mounted on a grid for analysis. Copper grids are the most commonly used, though for high temperature work, molybdenum grids are used. For nanoparticles and thin films, a C film is used as support. A C has low contrast in the TEM and will not obscure the contrast arising from the specimen. Some typical TEM grids are shown in the figure 8. Let us now discuss the thinning of sample by various techniques. The first one is the electrolytic polishing. 
electrolyting polishing is used for conducting samples like metals or alloys in order to produce samples that are electron transparent. The initial sheet thickness can be around a few hundred micrometer. This can be prepared by rolling or grinding bulk specimens. Similarly, the metal coatings on substrates can be peeled off and used for the final thinning. Thin gels can also be cut from bulk specimens. This process is called coating. These gels are thinned by electrolytic polishing. Electrolytic polishing technique is the window technique. The sample is made the anode and thin stainless sheet is made the cathode. The sample is immersed in the electrolyte which is usually cooled by water or liquid nitrogen. Perchloric acid is usually used as the electrolyte. The sample edges are covered by lacquer to expose a window and hence is the name. The experimental setup and the whole generation are shown in the figure. When a current is applied, the material is dissolved from the anode which is the sample and deposits on the cathode. The rate of dissolution depends on the current and applied voltage. The IV characteristics are shown in figure 10. Depending on the current and voltage, there are three regimes, etching, polishing and pitting. The edges are coated so that material removal will start within the window. Once a hole is formed within the window, the sample is pulled out. The region around the hole is usually electron transparent and can be mounted on a TEM grid. We next study the iron milling technique. For non-conducting samples, usually grinding and polishing steps are used in order to reduce sample thickness. Sometimes an ultramicrotome is used in order to generate thin samples. These can be either electron transparent or can be used as the starting material for further thinning. The schematic of the technique is shown in figure 11. For samples where ultra microtom cannot be used, then a standard tripod polisher is used in order to thin the sample. This produces samples that are a few nanometers thick. The final polishing step is done by an iron beam miller. The sample is bombarded with high energy ions on neutral atoms. Usually, argon ions are used and they are formed by passing the argon gas through a high voltage of the order of 4 to 6 kilo electron volt. The sample is held in vacuum and also usually cooled by liquid nitrogen. The ions are incident on the sample to sputter the material away. To minimize ion penetration, the beam is usually incident at low angle of the order of approximately 20 degrees. If the angle is very small, then the sputter rate is small. Iron beam is highly controlled and a localized process, but it is time consuming. Sputter rates are usually a few angstrom per second, so that creating an electron transparent sample can take hours, especially if the initial thickness is high. We next study the cross-sectional sample preparation. Slices from the sample are cut using a diamond slicer. These slices are placed between spacer layers and then glued onto a grid. The slices are glued in such a way that the interface is parallel to the slot in the grid. This sample is then thinned by standard tripod polishing until it is a few microns thick. The final sample is thinned using an iron beam miller to create an electron transparent sample. The cross sectional sample preparation is also shown in the figure 30. We next study 
the replica technique. Replica technique is used for studying bulk specimens which cannot be destroyed to prepare electron specimens. It is also useful for studying surface topography features and precipitates, though SEM techniques have gradually replaced replica sample preparation. A replica of the sample surface is prepared using a plastic mold. The mold is then removed from the surface and the surface of the specimen is replicated by the surface of the plastic. A thin film of carbon or metal like chromium or platinum is evaporated on the surface of plastic. Sometimes the evaporation is done from an oblique angle, shadow evaporation to enhance the contrast. The plastic is removed by dissolving in a suitable solvent and the film is then floated onto a grid for analysis. A replica of the sample surface is prepared using a plastic mold where the carbon, chromium or platinum metals are evaporated and the, it is washed with acetone to have a self-supporting replica. So students, let us now summarize what we have learned in this module. In this module, the working principle of transmission electron microscopy was described. Secondly, the instrumentation of transmission electron microscopy was described in detail. Then, the image modes of transmission electron microscopy was studied. The electron interaction with matter was discussed. Finally, the transmission electron microscope sample preparation was studied. Thank you students for your attention.